listening to The Big Album Show with Paul Dillon and Dan O'Neill. Hello and welcome to The Big Album Show. I'm Dan. And I'm Paul. It's easy to forget what a cultural phenomenon Oasis were. Perhaps Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich put it best when speaking about the Oasis zeitgeist. He said, in the mid-90s, wherever or whoever you were, when it was going down, you felt it. In the streets, and the pubs, the music press, on the radio, in the gossip rags, the concert halls, and affecting everything from the way people dressed, the way they cut their hair, what football team they supported, the way people communicated, one's accent, the list goes on and on. The Oasis phenomenon cut across all shapes, sizes, boundaries, and classes. Everybody knew Oasis, and in some way were impacted by them. And if they didn't love them, it was often the polarizing opposite. But most importantly, nobody didn't care. Everybody had an opinion, everybody had a thought, and nobody ignored them. No one. Tonight, we're talking about the band's difficult fourth album, Standing on the Shoulder of Giants, released on the 28th of February, 2000. And I think it's fair to say that this album certainly polarizes opinion. What are your thoughts on this uh, this album, Paul? Yeah, a great quote, Dan, to start the, this, uh, the show with. Does it, I mean, there's so much to say that you just almost don't know where to begin. Um, why don't we begin at the beginning, as somebody once said. They do definitely, maybe they do, what's the story, Morning Glory, they do be here now. And then they do standing on the shoulder, not standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, the 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 millenn it, it's the first it's their first record of the mil- new millennium. Um, it isn't it, it it is in many ways it is a new departure for the band. We've got a I mean you you put it well there how big Oasis were, but standing on the shoulders of giant shoulder of giants was a departure musically stylistically uh, for them. I would think that if, um, say, definitely maybe uh, Morning Glory and Be Here Now, if they're the night out, this album is the morning after. And um, it is the first ser- first and last probably serious Oasis album in that it does deal with emotion. Um, it deals with loss. It deals uh, with, I suppose, you know, could you call it, Anxiety, um, that's captured on Gas Panic. Something like Sunday Morning Call almost suggests a loneliness. Um, something like Who Feels Love really is trying to, I, you know, get it all back to the core of what your life maybe is supposed to be all about. Something like Little James deals with the birth of Liam's son. So I think Standing on the Shoulder of Giants captures the band at a fascinating period. All bands and all groups to be successful over a long period of time, they have to mature with the audience. They couldn't do supersonic shaker maker, champagne supernova, uh, stand by me. Do you know what I mean? They had to do something different, and they did. And I mean, at the time, I mean, particularly Noel hyped the album up hugely. He's a brilliant salesperson. He hyped it all up. He later disowned it. And then, you know, it, so, so th- their attitude with this album is complex and difficult. A couple of things to note on the album, Dan. Firstly, they come up with this new logo. I'm wearing it, it's on my top here. Uh, I got, I, the, 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 this stylized logo lasted for a very, very brief period of time um, just for this album and then for the live record uh, that followed it. So they get a new logo, they get a new look in the sense that it doesn't look like any of their previous records. It's a stylized picture um, of the New York skyline, skyline. That's the album cover. It's far less British in terms of, I mean, you know, the Britpop thing, this is not a Britpop record. I mean, you know, is it a psychedelic record? It is at times actually, but it's a rock record um, and they've certainly got an eye on the American or the North American uh, music scene on it in terms of how it's presented. Now, a few other things to note is they, they lose two members of the band during this period. Uh, so um, Giggsy, uh, the bass player, and uh, Bonehead <laughs> are, are gone. They did play on the record, um, but then they depart um, uh, during the period of its recording. And um, they're replaced by Noel himself. 
um, who, who plays a lot of the instruments on it. Later, we, we, we get in uh, Gem Archer and Andy Bell, but for now, we still have um, Liam Noel and Alan White on drums, and Alan, of course, later the parts himself. So this is a big change. I mean, we forget, you know, we forget Bonehead and Gigsy, but they were, you know, a huge part of it. And I mean, just in prep for this pod, I was listening back to interviews you know, and, and, you know, the first time when, when that Oasis got into, church, into the church, Noel was in Bonehead's flat, you know, listening to, 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 to the song Get There. And, and of course, he had, uh, Bonehead had played the, um, he was the rhythm guitar player, which, you know, is not a, not a small part of their early records, Bonehead, in terms of his contribution. Though that, of course, is disputed, particularly by Noel. Um, Giggsy then, of course, I mean, at one point, Liam said, you know, Giggsy is Oasis, he said at one point when it was rumoured that Giggsy would leave. But the point I'm making, Dan, is this is a huge departure for the band um, in every way. As I said, it's a, it's a departure musically, it's a departure, a departure stylistically, and it's a departure thematically. I really like it. I think that um, fucking in the bushes, go let it out, uh, who feels love, where did it all go wrong, gas panic, are all really, really top Oasis tunes. And um, most of it, this uh, this record is broadly forgotten. Um, on the Stop the Clocks record, the kind of the best stuff was released when they were leaving the Sony label. Um, only one tune from this album, Go Let It Out, actually gets on that record. Everything else uh, is, is, is almost forgotten. On the tour that followed it, they only played Go Let It Out, um, uh, Gas Panic and Who Feels Love. They didn't play the, the single Sunday Morning Call and there's a recording of Fucking in the Bushes. Uh, so it is almost a forgotten record, but I, I really think it's it's excellent. Um, and, you know, I really, really enjoyed it. Go back over for this pod, Dan. What did you think? I'm really interested in the point you made about this being Oasis' first uh, serious record. And um, indeed, I found an, ac an academic study which looked at the albums of Oasis and it did what they call a, a rhetorical analysis and looked at in, in one study by a guy called Ross Lumsden in Lynn University in Florida. What he did was he analyzed all of the Oasis albums and looked for themes and um, the themes of light and darkness right across their whole canon of work. So, for instance... When you think of light, you think of words like sun, shine, fire, uh, light. When you think of uh, dark, you might think of words like cloud, cold. And they analyzed all the lyrics in all of the Oasis albums to see what albums were the lightest and what albums were the darkest. And I'll give you an example. So if you look at What's the Story, Morning Glory, um, Lumsden counts 46 references to light and 15 references to dark. And this kind of ratio carries across all of the Oasis albums where there's more references to light words than dark words, except for this album. The ratio in this album is 11 references to light and 26 references to dark. And some of the dark words you hear throughout this album are, are words such as enemies, Ghost Dancer, Eyes Are Dead, Black Hole, Sing For His Soul, Day You Die, Tears Wrong, and Stormy Skies. So you can see in the, 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 the lyrics right throughout this album, it is a much darker Oasis album. And I 100% agree in what you said that, you know, if, if the other Oasis albums are the nighttime, this is the morning. Like this does feel like a come down album it feels like someone is withdrawing from the party lifestyle of the 90s you know and it, it, it like sunday morning uh calling is, is 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 clear evidence of that it's it's it really is a hungover kind of uh track um so it's a really interesting album i think it gets unfairly dissed i think there is some very very good tracks on the album but one track i am um, normally we pick out our three favorite and i'm sure we'll get to that but i have to say one track on the album i'm not so sure about i'm not going to completely diss it let me guess is, little uh, james yeah little james right yeah. so it's Liam's first step into the world of um songwriting now in fairness to liam 
I think the sentiment behind it is lovely. It's a beautiful thing to do to write a song for your 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 child, and I think he it it, it must have been so intimidating when he had a brother who was so brilliant at songwriting to kind of step into that, those shoes and to try and write songs for himself and as we know he's gone on to write some fantastic songs over the years and um, but I don't think Little James holds up as a song even though the sentiment is nice I don't think it holds up as a song I think the rest of the album is much better um, than, 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 than Little James what do you think Paul? See, I, I don't, I don't agree, and 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 genuinely, in, in all seriousness, I think, I mean, okay, so obviously, Liam was aping John Lennon as he did, and and on in many other things, the haircut, the shoes, the whole thing, and now the song about his son. I, I find it very touching, um, and I think the lyrics are very touching, and I mean, I, I know them off by heart, and I won't go do do the whole do the whole thing, but there's a part of the lyric where he says, "I'm singing this song." for you and your mom and that's all. It won't be long before all of us are gone. And it, it, it is dissed and, and Liam, you know, but for such a kind of, um, for, for, for this, for Liam to do a, a song like that and to be, be as honest and as emotionally truthful as that on, the, on, uh, on, on record, I think is a huge um, change from his previous approach to being a singer in Oasis. Um, I think the tune itself stands up fairly well. Um, Noel certainly thought it stood up well enough at the time to put it on the record because, of course, Noel, they were the, no call the shots. Um, it does divide opinion. Obviously, you have your view on it. Um, but for me, it's, it's, for me, it fits in absolutely fine. I have no problem giving it a spin. Um, and, you know, I think, as I said, it's, it's, Neem has never really done... I mean, Oasis... Okay, so very interesting what you said in terms of the, the academic analysis of the lyrics. But m most Oasis songs or Lean Gallagher songs, they quote unquote, don't mean anything. Whereas this album, Standing on the Shoulder of Giants, is the album where the songs meant a lot. And actually each of them, you could pick out a very clear theme. You could pick out very clear, um, you know, meaning in terms of the lyrics. And I think the song, Little, the, the Little James, it, what I like about Little James is it's that lullaby effect for a child. And I think that's really, really good. And um, it doesn't get into my top three. I mean, for me, Go Let It Out would be my top track off the album. I love the drum sound in it. Yes, I did once play in a band in secondary school <laughs> and we, we called the scandals, nothing scandalous about it, uh, other than its existence, perhaps. Uh, and that was our signature uh, tune. So I, I, I you know, I, I song that I'm intimately familiar with. But again, I think lyrically very, very strong. Um, also, there's a slight anti-monarch uh, sentiment in the lyrics. So there's a bit of politics coming in. That gets my number one. My number two would probably be Who Feels Love, uh, which was the, uh, the a single from the, the album. Um, I think it was the second single from the album. Um, it is, it's the third track on the album. It is one of the few songs that they played live on the rec afterwards. I think the, the band at the time really liked this. And it's interesting because it draws from the East for want of a better term. And you can see where they're going. You can see they're looking at probably, probably if we're honest, probably the Beatles as they matured and they were draw, drawn in that Eastern sound. I think it works really well. The lyric works really well. And um, the chorus is really good. And it was a very, very good live tune um, when I saw them in Lansdowne Road back in 2000. Probably my third song would probably be um, where did it all go wrong? Um, and again, lyrically, really, really strong. Do you keep a seat receipt for the friends that you buy? And again, it's a very clear rebuke uh, from Noel of the kind of maybe the lifestyle that he was living and experiencing in the years previous to the record. Yeah, I was at that gig in Lansdowne Road as well in 2000. Very, very good. I, I remember the, the standout moment for me was when they played Live Forever and they had John Lennon's face made up of, uh, you know, words from the song on the screen. It was a yeah. be be beautiful, beautiful moment. But yeah, like you, Go Let It Out would definitely be one of my um, number one songs on the album. It's interesting because as you mentioned the drum beat. It kind of sounds like it's looped rather than kind of played live. And you even have... Um, 
you know, record scratches coming in at the beginning where Noel says, pick up the bass, um, which is an unusual stylistic choice for a band who prided itself on being rock and roll and anti-synths and anti-sampling and all of those things. So as you say, they really were trying to change direction here, perhaps trying to tap more into the uh, the, the US market with the imagery and so on. Um, there was an awful lot of pressure on Oasis to do Huge better pressure. in America than yeah. they did. I'll give you an example. If you look at the first four Oasis albums, 17.5% um, of people at the time in the UK owned one of the albums, whereas in the United States, 2% of people owned one of the albums. But at the same time, you know, 2% of people in the United States owning your album is still a massive amount of people. So, I mean, they, they were relatively successful in the United States, although uh, Liam gets pissed off because apparently when he's going around the States, people call him Mr. Wonderwall and he doesn't like that at all. And um, Gas Panic would be another one of... Um, now, just before I, I move off, go let it out. I just want to take up on that point you made about it uh, being kind of anti anti monarchy. And um, I, I really that really resonated with me as well. I think that you know it is kind of like a kaleidoscope of imagery as a song. It's like a kind of I am the walrus esque, but there yeah. is that kind of class class consciousness that comes through yeah. in the lyrics. Uh, is it any wonder why princes and kings are clowns that caper in their sawdust rings? Ordinary people that are like you and me, we're the keepers of the destiny. If that doesn't get your blood pumping, I don't know what will. And um, then gas, gas panic is an incredible song. Uh, you know, what what tongueless ghost of sin creeps through my window? Now that's poetry, you know. That that's that's fantastic. And yeah. again, it's it's that kind of you know hangover buzz, the, the the anxiety creeping through your window after a heavy night in the session with your bro. And um, that's that's what I get from that. You can definitely see withdrawal, um, you know, weaved through this album. And likewise. You see the same theme on my, my third favorite song, which is Sunday Morning Calling, a song sung by Noel, um, acoustically driven um, song. Um, and yeah, it deals with withdrawal, hangover, perhaps depression, very different themes than, yeah. you know, roll with it or uh, what is it, Diggsy's Dinner or these kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, upbeat songs. Um, re 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 really interesting. And, and, and I, no, I, think, I think you're absolutely right, Dan. And I think a lot of that was lost on the commentary at the time. I mean, one of the lyrics in uh, Sunday Morning Call is, you know, do you feel what you're not supposed to feel? And mm. they're, they're, they're struggling, you know, you know it's, 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 it's struggling with feelings and it's, it, it, it's, you know, it's signifying something and it's pointing to something. Um, and that was not what you heard on Be Here Now, which was wall to wall, loud, swaggering rock music. Um, and it certainly wasn't what you heard on Definitely Maybe. Um, there was probably hints of a slightly more serious, um, you know, side on Morning Glory. But, you know, this was lyrically um, a departure. And, and I think a, a great tune. I mean, Gas Panic, as you mentioned, I mean, another really successful Oasis tune. The band, as I said earlier, really liked it at the time. They included it in the tour that followed up. Um, and if you listen back to the uh, the live at Wembley gig, they played Familiar, Familiar to Millions, which, which is not their finest live hour. We've got to be honest on that. Um, but it was it was made a, as a DVD at the time, which was a big deal, of course, and released as a live record and did very, very well. Of course, that's the, the record that includes the very, very good cover um, the, of, of Hey Hey My My by Neil Young which is brilliant that's a real standard on the record um, but they do on the gas panic that's included on that um, you can hear the crowd don't really know it right there, there's not there's a very muted response and Liam says come on it's a good tune this you know <laughs> um, though of course he, he also says uh, on Supersonic you should, write more, you should write more of these songs now and a few more of these babies so I mean it's little moments like that kind of give you an indication I think of the sort of slightly more complex feelings that the band have with this record and um, and other than go let it out it has kind of been forgotten and um, and I think that's I think that that's a great pity I mean when they when they I mean I've seen Oasis live um a number of times the last time I saw them was the big slam gig um 
of I think that was 2010 that summer um, and they'd even revived some of the they'd revived Be Here Now and uh, you know um, they were playing tracks from that album uh, on that tour but you never heard anything uh, from stand, from Standing on the Shoulder of Giants after uh, that period which I think is a pity and, and, and I think it's a shame I mean Oasis as a live band are interesting I mean all the times I've saw, saw, seen them that slaying gig wasn't great. That Lansdowne Road gig I thought was excellent. I saw them on Witness in uh, 2002, which I, I, I think the less said about that, the better. Though somebody I know threw a, um, a tennis ball at Liam and hit him and he, he withdrew from the stage. Uh, he's, that person shall remain nameless. <laughs> um, but the uh, I also saw them in Marley Park in 2005, which was an excellent gig. Um, sometimes the venue can have an impact on, on the gig. And of course, Dan, myself and yourself saw Liam in the hangar in the airport out in um, somewhere West, in West Dublin. West, Western Airport, is that the name of it? Western Airport. And I mean, yeah. that was incredible. Oh, and, I man. mean, absolutely brilliant. And, uh, what, what a fantastic night. And and uh, like, I have to say, Liam's voice, well, I, I've seen Oasis numerous times live as well. And that night, there was something special about that gig. Amazing. Liam, Liam was just... In, in top form and he sung a lot of great Oasis songs as well as the songs from his fantastic uh, first um, solo album um, but Fucking in the Bushes is a song off the album that stands out as well because it's 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 pretty much an instrumental song and there is uh, some 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 uh, words that are sampled over it which I'll come to in a second but um, of course that was used pretty much in every live gig by the band yes. uh, afterwards to open up point. and yeah, uh, was, Liam yeah. Liam still uses it to open up his solo gigs now but, and it was also used in it was either Lockstock or Snatch uh, the movies um, I think it was Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels it was used um, very predominantly like pr- pr- in, in a prime moment in that film and um, the gambling scene I think it's that film anyway um, but, but it's interesting the, the 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 sample of the the words in 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 that even that in itself is kind of cynical and and angry you kind of get the feeling that again comes back to this theme of with you know withdrawal kind of the the fame bubble bursting and and kind of having to reevaluate things because there's if you listen to the lyrics in the song if you can call them lyrics it says we put this festival on for you bastards with a lot of love we worked for one year for you pigs and you want to break our walls down and you want to destroy it. Well, you go to hell. And it's kind of what an opener to an album. Like, what are they saying there to their fans? And, and, and that it's, it's uh, I don't think we should read too far into it, but it definitely kind of, you know, strikes, you know, strikes a new tone immediately. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, that's drawn from the the words of the MC at the Isle of Wight Festival in 1970, the documentary film, they, they, they captured that. Um, and the other audio is captured from people talking about that festival uh, as well. And, you know, it, it's, it's really, really good because when you hear it, you wonder, is there a dialogue with the audience happening here? Are they saying something to the audience, you know? Um, or are they just really giving you a very, very um, loud, you know, sort of, um, you know, you know it, it, it's, it's an interesting way to start an album. And it's very, it is interesting to say, because I mean, actually everything else has been forgotten from the record, except that is actually, I mean, you mean you're correct. I was wrong earlier, said everything's been forgotten. I mean, fucking in the Bushes and Go Let It Out haven't been forgotten. And the fact that it, it, it you know, right up until any gig I've ever seen them play, that's the intro. It, it, it means an att- there's an attachment between the, with the band and that tune. And then Liam obviously, um, you, you know, still still uses it to this day, um, and it's a great starter. And you can play it really loud, and it'll sound really good. But also, it sounds very very different to what went before. So all most Oasis, you know, this thing about all Oasis albums music sounds the same again. That's, that's it's not true. I mean, but thematically, on their albums tend to sound the, the tracks of the albums tend to have have a certain sound running through them sonically, and and often lyrically as well. Um, but fucking in the bushes is a very clear difference to what you heard on Be Here Now. Um, and, you know, I think it's a very successful way to start the album. And I like the way that at the end they go, they, 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 it's only 10 tracks, quite short. I think it's about 50 minutes. But at the end, they do roll it over. Um, and again, you know, it, it's kind of, you're, you're, 
you're getting the, the lyric there is I suppose referring to a rollover in terms of a you know a continuing a nice morning out that just keeps going on but again there's a great it's very melancholy you know and it's 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 a quite a quiet oasis tune um and it's I, I think it finishes it really really well so they start high in the end low and in between they bring you on this little journey about where the band were at a time or Noel's bringing you on that journey mainly and um, so I mean I think it's a very successful record I think it's a very coherent record I think it makes a lot of sense um and um I think uh, you know you, you did mention it earlier and it is fair to say it does get its fair share of stick and its criticism um but I think a lot of that is quite unfair and yeah. it deserves uh, to be perhaps reconsidered now. You see, I mean, one of the, of course, the problem with Stan, and I think, again, the band talked about this. I mean, at one point, Noel said, it's a pity they, they just went, they didn't release, definitely maybe Morning Glory, and then went straight to standing on the shoulders of Giants. But uh, Be Here Now got, was in the way there. And then later, Be Here, Be Here Now has kind of been revived since. Um, <laughs> it, it, the band, of, Noel also walked away from that. I mean, Noel and Liam, I mean, they've said so many things, so much of a contradictory, um, it, you know, they, they, I may, may have, I may have picked that up from them myself. You know, they, <laughs> they, they don't, they're not always consistent, but they had a rebuke of uh, Be Here Now. And then they, they went to standing on the shoulder of giants and they were really hyping, hyping that up. And later, of course, uh, particularly now sort of dismissed uh, standing on the shoulder of giants. So, you know, perhaps the fact that that album is dismissed by a lot of fans has to do with the band's uh, relationship with it, but it deserves to be rehabilitated. Mm-hmm. And it deserves to be remembered for a braver, more honest, more emotional record that a lot of what Oasis uh, produced. So um, if you haven't heard it, I'm, I would strongly recommend give it a whirl, give it a go. There's a few tunes we haven't uh, that talked about. Um, there's I Can See a Liar, which is kind of a straightforward rock sort of tune, isn't it, Dan, really? Um, but it, would, would it be fair to say a more American, North American rock sound happening there? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think, I, yeah, yeah, I'd go with that, you know, it, and, and even the lyrics are kind of more... American style and um, like when you think back to 2000 2001 like Oasis were coming down off such a high um, and music was changing um, and yeah. there was an awful kind of trend of these dreadful new metal bands uh, that were out there <laughs> and and for a yeah. while but for a while like Oasis were seen where they were kind of seen as uncool like they were they, they were they were a, a band that everyone liked because everyone had bought their cds a few years previous but people kind of almost listened to them on the sly as opposed to very publicly it was much more cool i think amongst young people who liked rock music to like your your metallicas and your nirvanas and your new metal bands and um, rather than oasis for a short period but funny enough like i quoted the guy from metallica earlier on who ne- names oasis as his favorite band you know people like dave Grohl from nirvana and the foo fighters name oasis as one of his favorite bands you know so i think that people came back to Oasis um, and, you know, people really do like, uh, like they were just a, an incredibly culturally significant band um, with great tunes, great songwriting. And what I, what I find so, so exciting is that both Liam and Noel are still releasing good music. Like granted they're releasing music apart um, but they're releasing um, good music. And, you know, Liam has a new album on the way, I believe. Um, Noel has done some really interesting stuff. We won't mention the fact he had a woman in his band that played the scissors. We'll, we'll, we'll put that aside. Maybe he got notions on that one. But, uh, and they're also, when, when are they releasing their, um, the, the, the film about the Nebwork concerts? Do you know, yeah. very soon. And, and, and of course, Liam is returning to the scene and doing two shows at Network next year, which are going to be absolutely massive and incredible. And of course, Dave Grohl has declared the war between Liam and Noel sort of over and, and has said that Liam has has won. Um, but look, I mean, you could talk about all they could talk about their place in rock history mm-hmm. all night. There is no doubt we did see the likes of them before because they drew really heavily on the Beatles. They drew heavily on the Rolling Stones, drew heavily on the Sex Pistols, the Jam and the Smiths. I think they're the bands who primarily they drew from. And, 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 and Oasis were a gateway drug, a musical yeah. gateway drug. Because people of our generation, Paul, like we got 
addicted to the Stones, the Beatles, the Sex Pistols, True. all of the bands yeah. you mentioned via Oasis because Absolutely. Oasis were in all the music magazines yeah. saying, well, we want to be the next Beatles. You want to be the next Stones. And of course, as a young person, what do you do? You go, well, I better listen to these guys because if this is the band, or if these are the bands Oasis are listening to, you know, I want to be on board with those. So they were really a gateway drug for a lot of people of our age group. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, you know, huge Irish uh, connections. I mean, I mean, I mean, and of course, Wonderwall, which Noel famously credited as, as, as having, um, you know, been inspired, uh, uh, you know, the Irish ballad. Um, but again, Noel says so many things, you can't necessarily take it all to, 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 to heart, but a folk ballad. Um, and of course, at one point, they, when, when asked to do a, a song, I think for the 96, uh, or was it 2000, um, in, uh, Euros. Um, I'm, I'm not an authority on football, so I can't get those dates completely right. But he, I can get this quote right. But they said to him, "Would no? Would you do? Would Oasis do a song for the English football team?" And he said, "No." He said, um, "We're Irish, let do it." So you know, <laughs> and of course, where I'm from, um, huge Oasis connection around Dulik and and Drada, many cousins, many family, and um, the. Their granny um, on their on their father's side lived in the in, in the village in Dulik uh, where I grew up. Um, their uncles uh, had a quarry on my road growing up. So you know, there's a lot of connections with Oasis. So many Irish people have that connection. <laughs> but the thing I want to say, and I think I'll leave it on leave it on this. I mean, you know, standing on the shoulder of giants, as I said, deserves rehabilitation. If you're not familiar with it, give it a listen. If you don't agree with us. Let us know, and we're happy to hear your opposite take. Just let us know, tag us at the Big Album Show. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but I think, Dan, on, my, on, on, on listening to this record uh, over the last couple of weeks again, the big thing that reminded me about Oasis is I think Oasis were the last cross-generational band, right? And um, to stretch this out a bit, I was listening to George Hamilton there do an interview last weekend, and he was talking about doing when the, the 1990 World Cup, when Ireland played Romania and that famous penalty shootout, that was featured on RC1 or Network 2. And everybody who was watching TV in Ireland at that moment was watching that penalty shootout. So the age of the mass audience before what's happened in the last number of decades, the, uh, you know, the breakdown into all the different, uh, you know, technology has facilitated this great breakdown of audiences. It's very difficult to capture a mass audience. Oasis were the last band to capture a mass audience. The chances are your granny, your granddad knew about Oasis. Every generation in your family would have known about Oasis. Your neighbor knew about Oasis. Everybody knew about Oasis. And they released Standing on the Shoulder of John when they were still at the peak of that. Things changed, um, but their place in rock history will never change right up there. Um, they'll never be uh, replaced, I think, as the greatest band uh, of our generation. Um, and this album is a great album that deserves to be considered with the best of their work, I think. Absolutely. And with that, we'll sign off for tonight. Thanks for listening to The Big Album Show. Um, do like our posts on social media do subscribe do tell your friends and um, do join the big album show community and um, because with independent podcasting um it's all down to yes. the audience it's all down to the community and um, so so we thanks don't for take listening. any we really appreciate it. yeah we haven't yeah. been offered <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody good night bye you're listening to the big album show with paul and dan please remember to subscribe hit like and remember to follow us on our social media platforms at The Big Album Show.